Hi everyone, uh, today we are starting the uh, fifth seminar of the seminar series uh, organized by the Bank of Ceylon under the uh, Nanajaya program. So uh, today in this section we are focusing on the uh, seventh lesson of our syllabus, uh, the uh, money, uh, banking and then the uh, general price level. So, uh, in this discussion, uh, I'm trying to focus uh, some uh, focus on the structured questions mainly uh, because uh, in this discussion we are trying to focus on how uh, we need to develop the answer writing for the uh, structured questions. So along with some uh, structured questions and afterwards along with some uh, multiple choice questions we are doing the discussion of the uh, today's discussion uh, based on the money banking and the general price level. so we will uh, start the discussion so the first question what do you mean by money what are the major functions of money what do you mean by money and what are the major functions of money? We define money as anything which is commonly accepted as a medium of exchange. Anything which is a common medium of exchange, anything which is commonly accepted as a medium of exchange is identified as money. So we say that money is a 100% liquid asset. What do we mean by money is a 100% liquid asset? Anyone uh, is bound to accept money as a mode of receiving incomes and uh, money as a mode of making payments as well. So therefore, we can define money as anything which is commonly accepted as a medium of exchange and money is a 100% liquid asset. So we can define money in that way. And we identify four functions in relation to money. Money is acting as a medium of exchange. And then money is acting as a unit of accounting. Also, money is acting as a store of wealth. And then money is acting as a standard of deferred payments. So, uh, we can make payments in terms of money for anything what we purchase in the market and then we can sell the goods and services what we produced for a certain monetary value. We identify the, this as the medium of exchange, the function of money as a medium of exchange. Also, if there was nothing called money, it will be really difficult to express the value of goods and services, right? If there was nothing called money, we might have to say one table equals to some four jars. One excise book is equal to some two or three pence. But with the use of money, we can express the value of goods and services in terms of money. This function of money we identify as the money is acting as a unit of accounting. Also, we can store the wealth, the value that we created in different different forms. We can buy a plot of land and store the wealth there. Right? That is, we can uh, store wealth in terms of real assets, a plot of land, some gold jewelries. Like this, we can store, use money also as a mode of storing wealth. We can store money also. We can uh, va store value in terms of money. We might have a savings deposit. We might have a fixed deposit. Right? We might have simply the currency notes and coins can be kept uh, as a store of wealth. So like this, money is acting as a store of wealth. In addition, the money is acting as a standard of deferred payments. What do we mean by the money is acting as a standard of deferred payments? We can borrow loans in terms of money. We can borrow a loan in terms of money. Also, a previously borrowed loan can be repaid in terms of money. 
So this function of money is acting, is identified as the standard of deferred payments. So here the question is what do you mean by money and what are the major functions of money? Right. So there are two sections of the question. You need to give equal weight on the two sections of the question. You should define money as a, anything which is commonly accepted as a medium of exchange and money is a 100% liquid asset. And then we should state the four functions of money here. Uh, money is acting as a medium of exchange. Money is acting as a unit of accounting. Money is acting as a store of wealth and then money is acting as a uh, standard of deferred payments. Right. We'll move on to the next question. Question number two. What do you mean by barter system? Explain how money removed the defects of the barter system. So what do we mean by money? Before the usage of money as a common medium of exchange, people were exchanging goods and services for people were exchanging goods and services for other goods and services people were exchanging goods and services for other goods and services for an example maybe a person who has a stock of rice is exchanging that stock of rice with a person uh, with uh, some other type of grains or else maybe a stock of rice the stock of rice is exchanged with another person for some stock of salt or else maybe the stock of rice is exchanged with another person for some uh, amount of clothes like this exchanging goods and services for other goods and services is identified as the barter system so in the first section of this answer that is explained right exchanging a good or a service for another good or a service is identified as the barter system exchanging a good or a service for another good or a service is identified as the barter system so as an example we can say a person who has a stock of rice may exchange it with another person for some clothes so that is the first section of the question what do you mean by the barter system and in the second section of the question we are supposed to explain how money removed the defects of the barter system how money removed the defects of the barter system. During the barter system, people faced for various difficulties. One problem people faced during the barter system was the absence of double coincidence of phones. Absence of double coincidence of phones is one major problem faced by the people during the barter system. What do we mean by the absence of a double coincidence of wounds? A person, say a person is having some rice and he needs some clothes. So, in order to take place a transaction, this person should find out a person who needs rice and who has clothes. That is, in other words, the wants of the parties who enter into the exchange should mutually agree with each other. If there is no mutual agreement between the wants of the parties who enter into the exchange, the exchange cannot take place. So, the absence of double coincidence of wants was a major drawback people faced during the barter system. But along with the usage of money, right? anyone who wish to purchase a good or a service can go to the market and pay in terms of currency notes and coins and purchase that respective product. So therefore, we don't need to identify any mutual agreement between the wants of the parties when entering into the transactions with the use of money can purchase goods and services by paying in terms of money. To the other way, anyone who produces a good or a service can sell that respective good or that respective service for some monetary consideration. Right? 
so in that case when money is in use we don't need to identify any mutual agreement between the wants of the parties so we say that the problem of double coincidence of wants the absence of double coincidence of wants was solved through the use of money that was actually the major drawback people faced during the barter system and another drawback people faced during the barter system was the absence of a common measure of value in order to exchange goods and services there should be a certain value for those goods and services now if we are thinking of exchanging a stock of rice for a stock of salt we need to clearly define or identify how much of rice should be exchanged with a certain amount of uh, salt so for that there should be a value for rice and there should be a certain value for cloth sorry salt right so when there is nothing called money we will have to express the value of one good or a service in terms of another good or a service when one person measures the value of a table in terms of jars another person may measure the value of the same table in terms of some rice so there is no a common measure of value when there is nothing called money but along with the usage of money people could express the value of goods and services in terms of money we can say one table equals to 50000 rupees we can say one chair equals to 10000 rupees we can say one kilogram of rice is equal to 100 rupees like this we can express the value of goods and services in terms of money so therefore the problem of uh, not having a common measure of value was also solved through the use of money so like this we can identify two major drawbacks of the barter system and identify how they were solved along with the use of money uh, when answering this question but apart from these two major uh, drawbacks of the barter system not being able to divide into small parts was a drawback but with the use of money like there are different valued currency notes and coins so the divisibility is there along with money and difficulty of carrying out or transporting from one place to another place was also a major drawback of money so a major drawback of the barter system but along with the use of money we could uh, easily carry some amount of money from one place to another place and engage in transactions so like this almost all all the drawbacks of the barter system could be solved using the uh, money as a medium of exchange so therefore in this question what do you mean by barter system you should define the barter system better you define it along with a small example and then you should identify at least two major drawbacks of the barter system and should explain how they are solved use based on the use of money so see absence of double coincidence of wants was a major drawback of the barter system along with the use of money people could purchase goods and services by paying in terms of money also could sell goods and services for money through this the absence of double coincidence of wants was solved right so we identified one major drawback of the uh, barter system and explain how it is solved through the use of money and then absence of a common measure of value was uh, also a major drawback of barter system with the use of money people could express the value of goods and services in terms of money through this the absence of common measure of value could also be solved so Uh, in answering these kind of structured questions you should give the due attention to the sub sections of a question right so here they are asking us to define the uh, barter system so you should define barter system properly maybe supporting with an example and afterwards the next section of the question is to explain how Uh, the barter system solved the problem uh, problems associated sorry how the use of money solved the 
drawbacks associated with the barter system that should be uh, addressed or answered by at least using two uh, drawbacks of the barter system and explaining how uh, those drawbacks were solved along with the use of money. So again, uh, when answering these kind of structured questions, you need to give the due attention to the subsections and you need to separately address the subsections of the question. Fine, we will move on to the next question. Question number three, explain the difference between near money and then money substitutes using examples. So if this was for uh, four marks, if this is a question for four marks, it will like they may allocate one mark for defining near money, one mark for stating examples for near money, one mark for defining substitutes, uh, money substitutes and then another mark for uh, giving examples for the money substitutes. So what do we mean by the money substitutes? Money substitutes, first of all we will define the near money. Near money refers to the high liquid financial assets which can be easily converted into a medium of exchange. Near money refers to the high liquid financial assets which can be easily converted into a medium of exchange. Near money acts as a store of wealth but near money does not act as a medium of exchange. Near money acts as a store of wealth but near money does not act as a medium of exchange. Right? And then to the other way, what do we mean by the money substitutes? Money substitutes refer to the temporary mediums of exchange which do not act as a store of wealth. So money substitutes are acting as a temporary medium of exchange but the money substitutes do not act as a store of wealth. So, the uh, definition of near money. Near money refers to the high liquid financial assets which can be easily converted into a medium of exchange. Near money acts as a store of wealth but do not act as a medium of exchange. Right? The definition and then the example savings deposits, fixed deposits. In addition to these, you can identify the treasury bills, treasury bonds, all these as examples for the near money. And then the definition of money substitutes. Money substitutes refer to the temporary mediums of exchange which do not act as a store of wealth. Right? So always should give the proper definition. And then the best examples which we can give for money substitutes is the credit cards. In addition to the credit cards, the debit cards can also be taken as an example for the uh, money substitutes. Right. Next question, explain why credit cards are not treated as money. So you have to explain why the credit cards are not treated as money. First of all, we will see what is meant by a credit card. A credit card is a temporary medium of exchange. When you are a credit card holder, you can use that credit card to make payments up to a specific credit limit when purchasing goods and services. So therefore, a credit card is a temporary loan facility offered by a certain financial institution. At the end of the period, you have to go back to the uh, financial institution which issued the credit card and should make that respective amount of money in terms of currency notes and coins and settle that transaction. So here we are supposed to explain, here we are supposed to explain why Credit cards are not treated as money. What do we mean by money? We define money as anything which is commonly accepted as a medium of exchange. Anything which is commonly accepted as a medium of exchange is what we identify as money. 
So money fulfills four major functions. Money is acting as a medium of exchange. Money is acting as a uh, measure of value. Money is acting as a uh, store of wealth. And then money is acting as a standard of deferred payments. So therefore, so for something to be treated as money, we should be able to identify all these functions in relation to that respective medium. But when it comes to a credit card, a credit card is just a temporary medium of exchange. It does not fulfill all the functions of money. It is just a temporary medium of exchange. But a credit card is not acting as a store of wealth. Right? So as the credit cards are not performing all the functions of money, as a credit card is not performing all the functions of money, we identify a credit card is not a money. We do not identify credit card as money. And the other thing is, when you make a payment in terms of a currency note or a coin, when you make a payment in terms of a currency note or a coin, no financial obligation will remain in relation to that transaction after the payment is done. Now for an example, if you went to a shop and bought some good from that shop and paid in terms of currency notes and coins, the financial obligation towards that transaction will be over after making that payment. But say the same transaction we carried out by using a credit card. We make the payment using a credit card. With that transaction, the financial liability towards that transaction will not be over. The financial liability towards that transaction will be over only when we make the payment of currency notes and coins or that respective value to the financial institution which issued that respective credit card. So because of these reasons, we say that a credit card is not money. So we will see how to develop the answer for this. Money refers to anything which is commonly accepted as a medium of exchange. Money is a 100% liquid asset. So we defined money first. Afterwards, but Credit cards are a money substitute which acts as a temporary medium of exchange but do not act as a store of value. So we defined money and then we identified what is a credit card and then afterwards we say as it does not fulfill all the functions of money, credit cards are not treated as money. So like this, we need to directly say why a credit card is not treated as money. We defined money, we identified what is meant by a credit card and we say because the credit card is not performing all the functions of money, a credit card is not treated as money. And the other thing is also when a payment is made with money, no further financial obligation is retained towards that respective transaction. But when a payment is made with credit cards, the financial obligation towards that transaction will be over only when the respective amount of money is paid to the financial institution which issued the credit card. So therefore, credit cards are not treated as money. So therefore, we have to develop the answer and present it in a proper flow in a structured question like this. Question number 5. What do you mean by high powered money? What are the factors which decide the amount of high powered money in an economy? So, we are supposed to define high powered money here and we need to identify the determinants of high powered money. First of all, we will see what is meant by the high powered money. We define high powered money as the financial assets which provide the basis for the money supply of a country. 
the financial assets which provide the basis for the money supply of a country is what we identify as the high powered money monetary base reserve money are also some words used to identify the high powered money monetary base reserve money are also some words used to identify the high powered money we say that the money supply of a country is a certain number of times of the high powered money we say that the money supply of a country is a certain number of times of this high powered money in very simple terms even though we do not define high powered money in this way high powered money refers to the uh, currency notes and coins issued by the monetary authority or in other words based on sri lanka the central bank of sri lanka so if central bank did not issue currencies to this economy we will not be able to identify any money supply what do we mean by the money supply money supply refers to the stock of money held by the general public of a country as at a given point of time money supply refers to the stock of money held by the general public of a country as at a given point of time so money supply mainly comprises of two components the currency held by public and then the various types of deposits the public holds in the banking system currency held by public and then the various types of deposits the public holds in the banking system are the two major components of the money supply so therefore if central bank or the monetary authority of the economy did not issue currencies to the economy we won't be able to identify something called currency held by public and we won't be able to identify something called the deposits held by public in the banking system that that is why we say that the high powered money is the financial assets which provide the money basis for the money supply of the country based on the high powered money issued by the monetary authority of the economy only the money supply of the country is formed right so therefore the central bank is creating this high powered money in the economy by acquiring various types of assets we say that every currency note and coin what as general public we hold is a direct financial liability towards the central bank right every currency note and coin the general public of an economy holds is a direct financial liability to the central bank because the central bank is the issuing entity of this high powered money so central bank offers uh, prints currencies and issues uh, them as loans to the government the central bank is uh, offering loans to the commercial banks the central bank is purchasing foreign currencies in the foreign exchange market through that the central bank is issuing currencies and release into the economy when the government borrows loans from the central bank and uses that money to pay off salaries to the public sector employees and to purchase other goods and services they wanted what happens is this high powered money will be released to the economy right so say government offers a 1000 million loan to the central bank is offering a 1000 million loan to the government so it creates an asset called of loans offered to the government worth of 1000 million to the central bank so central bank creates an asset which is identified as loans offered to the government and through that the currency is released to the government 
like this by acquiring various assets only the central bank is releasing this high powered money to the economy so the amount of high powered money the central bank has issued to the economy as at a given point of time the amount of money the central bank has issued to the economy as at a given point of time depends upon the amount of assets they have acquired as at a given point of time the amount of loans the central bank has uh, given to the government the amount of loans the central bank has uh, given as loans to the commercial banks the amount of foreign currencies the central bank has purchased from the foreign exchange market as at a given point of time the amount of other assets the central bank has uh, acquired will decide the amount of high powered money the central bank has released to the economy in very simple terms for understanding peer purpose the amount of rupee notes and coins the central bank has released to the economy as at a given point of time depends upon the lo- amount of loans the central bank has offered to the government the amount of loans the central bank has offered to the commercial banks the amount of foreign currencies the uh, central bank has purchased from the foreign exchange market and then the other assets the central bank has acquired as at that given point of time if the total of these assets say for an example the total figure of uh, the loans offered to the government loans offered to the commercial banks the foreign currencies purchased and other assets purchased is uh, 5000 million uh, as at a given point of time by the central bank what does this mean the central bank has released high powered money worth of 5000 million to this economy that is the high powered money in this economy as at this given point of time should be 5000 million rupees because the central bank has acquired a total asset worth of uh, 5000 million so the amount of net assets the central bank holds as at a given point of time the amount of net assets the central bank has acquired as at a given point of time decides the amount of high powered money the central bank has released to the economy as at a given point of time the amount of high powered money the central bank has released to the economy as at a given point of time so therefore we identify the determinants of high powered money of an economy based on the amount of net assets the central bank has acquired as at a given point of time the amount of net assets the central bank has acquired as at a given point of time so we will go to the question what do you mean by high powered money so you should properly define high powered money for this section and the best thing is to state the components of high powered money as well so high powered money refers to the high liquid financial assets which provide the basis for the money supply of a country better you say the high powered money refers to the financial assets which provide the basis for the money supply of a country money supply of a country is a certain number of times of the high powered money right and then the components of high powered money we identify three major components of high powered money the components of high powered money are identified based on the possession of the high powered money the central bank has released up to the given point of time from the total currency notes and coins printed and issued by the central bank a part should be there with the general public of the economy 
general public of the country. We identify this as the currency held by public. A part of the high-powered money released by the central bank should be there with the general public of the country. We identify this as the currency held by public. We identify this as the currency held by public. And then another part of the high-powered money released by the central bank as at a given point of time should be there with the commercial banks. We identify this as the currency held by commercial banks. In addition, a part of the high-powered money released by the central bank may be maintained by the commercial banks in terms of the deposits with the central bank. Right? So, therefore, uh, we, I already told you that high-powered money is a direct financial liability to the central bank. So, we identify the components of high-powered money. We identify the components of high-powered money based on the uh, liabilities of the central bank towards whom the central bank is holding the liability. So, we identify three major components of high-powered money, currency held by public, currency held by commercial banks and then deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank. In addition to these three major components of the high-powered money, we can identify a fourth component as well, that is the deposits held by the government agency institutions in the central bank. But identifying these three components to the high-powered money is enough. What are those? Currency held by public, currency held by commercial banks and then deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank like this. So with this we answered the first section of the question. What is the first section of the question? What do you mean by the high powered money? So we defined high powered money and we stated the components of high powered money. But the second section of the question is what are the factors which decide the amount of high powered money in an economy? So, we identify the determinants of high-powered money based on the net assets of the central bank. The amount of high-powered money the central bank, the monetary authority of the country has released to the economy as at a given point of time decides upon the amount of assets they have acquired. The central bank releases high powered money by acquiring various assets no? the central bank releases high powered money to the economy by acquiring various assets so the total amount of net assets the central bank has acquired as at a given point of time decides the amount of high powered money they have released to the economy as at this given point of time. So, therefore, the net loans offered to the government by the central bank, the loans offered to the commercial banks by the central bank, and then the net foreign assets acquired by the central bank. Also, the net other assets acquired by the central bank decides the amount of high powered money of the economy. So, again, the components of high powered money are identified based on the net based on the liabilities of the central bank whereas the determinants of high powered money are identified based on the net assets of the central bank the amount of high powered money the central bank has released to the economy as at a given point of time depends upon the amount of assets they have acquired as at that given point of time. So, this is how we answer this question. We will move on to the next question. What are the channels used by the central bank to create high powered money? Explain how high powered money is created through them. 
as we discussed in the previous question how does the central bank create high powered money they are releasing high powered money to the economy by acquiring various assets so we identify two major channels used by the central bank to release high powered money to the economy one is offering loans to the government and to the commercial banks the central bank is offering loans to the government and the central bank is offering loans to the commercial banks through that the central bank is releasing high powered money to the economy the central bank is creating high powered money within the economy now say the central the government demands for a loan from the central bank how does the central bank offer that loan to the uh, government in the recent past they are like the sri lankan government uh, has borrowed a lot from the central bank so the central bank will uh, issue that respective amount of rupee currencies to the government so in one hand it creates an asset to the central bank called loans offered to the government on the other hand the government will be re receiving that respective amount of currencies from the uh, central bank so from central bank's point of view when we see in one hand it creates an asset to the central bank which i already told you the loans offered to the government on the other hand it creates a liability to the central bank what is the liability created to the central bank here the currencies issued i told you that currencies issued by the central bank is a direct financial liability to the central bank so in one hand an asset is created to the central bank through releasing high powered money loans offered to the government on the other hand it creates a liability the currency is issued to the economy so when central bank offers a loan to the government in terms of currency notes and coins the government will use that currency notes and coins to pay salaries to their employees to purchase other goods and services to carry out the government operations as a result these currency notes and coins become the assets of the general public of the country right this is one method of releasing the currency notes and coins issued by the central bank printed by the central bank to the economy because as the general public we do not carry out direct transactions with the central bank but at last the currency is printed and issued by the central bank is they are with us they become the assets of us so one channel used by the central bank to release this high powered money to the economy is they uh, issue these currency notes and coins and uh, offer loans to the government another method of releasing high powered money to the economy is the central bank is offering loans to the commercial banks central bank is offering loans to the commercial banks when a commercial bank uh, requests for a loan from the central bank the central bank will release that respective amount of currency notes and coins to that respective commercial bank in one hand it creates an asset to the central bank what is it the loans offered to the commercial banks from central bank's point of view the loans offered to the commercial banks is an asset to that uh, the central bank on the other hand it creates a liability to the central bank what is the liability the currency is issued to the economy so through this explanation you all need to understand that each currency note and coin printed and issued to the economy creates a liability to the central bank and also each currency and note released to the economy is released by the central bank by uh, acquiring various assets so one channel used to release high powered money is offering loans to the government and to the commercial banks 
The other channel of releasing high-powered money to the economy is purchasing foreign currencies in the foreign exchange market. Central bank is the responsible institution to operate the foreign exchange rate policy of the country. Central bank is the institution which is responsible to operate the foreign exchange rate policy of the country. Right? So, when there is a surplus supply of foreign currencies in the foreign exchange market. Now for an example, say during as at a given point, the dollar demand in the foreign exchange market is some $2,000 million. But say there is a dollar supply of some $3,000 uh, million dollars during that given day's period. The supply of dollars is greater than the demand for dollars in the foreign exchange market. You should be aware mainly for imports we are demanding for dollars. Right? If we wanted to import goods and services from abroad, we need to make that respective payment in terms of dollars. So we go to the foreign exchange market and demand for dollars to make these respective payments to the rest of the world. To the other way, the exporters are receiving their incomes in terms of dollars and other foreign currencies and they will supply these foreign currencies to the foreign exchange market in order to convert these dollars and other foreign currencies into rupees to the domestic currency unit. So, at a given point, if the dollar supply or in general the foreign currency supply to the foreign exchange market is greater than the foreign currency demand in the foreign exchange market, that surplus supply should be purchased by the central bank. That surplus supply should be purchased by the central bank. How does the central bank purchase? The central bank issues currencies, rupee coins and notes to the economy and purchase that respective amount of dollars for the other foreign currency types. So in one hand it creates an asset to the central bank, what is it? The foreign currencies acquired or in general we can identify this as the foreign assets acquired by the central bank. On the other hand, it creates a liability to the central bank, what is it? currencies issued to the economy. So therefore, these are the uh, two channels used by the central bank to release high powered money to the economy. In the second channel, when the central bank purchases foreign currencies in the foreign exchange market by releasing rupee coins and notes to the economy, they become the assets of the general public of this country. So, uh, what are the channels used by the central bank to create high powered money? There are two channels offering loans to the government and commercial banks is treated as one channel and then the second channel is purchasing foreign currencies in the foreign exchange market. So first of all, should identify the two channels used by the central bank to release high powered money to the economy. So in the next section, I am explaining or we should explain how the uh, these channels are releasing high powered money to the economy, are creating high powered money in the economy. So in the first paragraph, when the central bank offers to the lo offers loans to the government, the government uses that money to pay salaries to the public sector employees and purchase other goods and services. Through this, high powered money is released to the economy, we discussed. So, in the first paragraph, we are explaining how the uh, loans offered to the government is creating high powered money in the economy. Second one, when central bank offers loans to the commercial banks, they use them for offering loans to the general public. Through this, high powered money is released to the economy or through this, high powered money is created. Also, when there is a surplus supply of foreign currencies in the foreign exchange market, central bank purchases them by issuing high powered money. Through this, high powered money is released to the economy. So, in this question, we first identifies we first identified the channels used by the central bank to release high powered money to the economy. And in the second section, we explained how each of these channels are creating high-powered money in the economy 
or are releasing high powered money to the economy so uh, like this in these kind of questions if there are subsections like this you should separately address those separate sections we will move on to the next question question number 7 what do you mean by liquidity preference what are the reasons for liquidity preference the liquidity preference is another word used to identify the money demand liquidity preference is another word used to identify the money demand what do we mean by the money demand the money demand refers to the preference of general public to hold currencies or hold money with them in terms of currency notes and coins. The preference of general public to hold money in terms of currency notes and coins as at a given point of time is what we identify as the money demand. As an individual, if you kept 10,000 rupees in your pocket, even after a month's time, you only get that same 10,000 rupees. Right? If you kept 10,000 rupees with you, after a month's time also, if you, say, uh, if you see, you will see the same 10,000 rupees. But if you deposited this 10,000 rupees in a fixed deposit, if you invested this 10,000 rupees in the share market, or if you invested this 10,000 rupees in another business activity, that you can generate some income right if you deposited this money in a fixed deposit you can get some interest income if you deposited this uh, if you bought some shares uh, from the share market you may get some dividends or else you may get some capital gain through that what does this mean holding currencies in our hands creates an opportunity cost for us Holding currencies uh, with us is creating an opportunity cost for us. It loses the opportunity of investing this somewhere else and generating some income for us. Generating some income for us. Even at such an opportunity cost, even at such an opportunity cost, People are tending to keep some cash balance with them on three major reasons. What are those? Transaction motive, precautionary motive and then speculative motive are the three reasons as to why people create a demand for money. Liquidity preference and money demand are exactly the same. What do we mean by the transaction motive money demand? There are gaps of earning incomes for every uh, person. Some people are earning on daily basis. Some people are earning on weekly basis. Some people are earning on monthly basis. Some people may be earning incomes for every three months time. Like this, there is a gap of earning incomes for people. But a person cannot wait until he gets his next income to carry out his day-to-day -day transactions. He cannot wait until the next month or the next, uh, like, uh, the next time he gets his income to carry out his day-to-day -day transactions. He need to buy goods and services to um, survive. Huh? He might have to consume some services, goods and uh, some other goods and all. For that, he has to have some money with him. Right? So, the amount of money, the currencies kept by the general public in order to smoothly carry out the day-to-day -day transactions within the gaps of earning incomes is identified as the transaction motive money demand. Is identified as the transaction motive money demand. The transaction motive money demand is identified as a positive function of the level of income. What does this mean? When the level of income increases, the transaction motive money demand goes up. And when the level of income goes down, the transaction motive money demand goes down. When the level of income increases, the transaction motive money demand goes up. 
and when the level of income decreases the transaction motive money demand goes down right to the other way what do we mean by the precautionary motive money demand the precautionary motive money demand refers to the preference of general public to hold currencies with them in order to successfully face for various unexpected situations people may face for illnesses sudden functions and all unexpected situations in order to successfully face for these kind of unexpected situations people tend to keep some cash balance with them right so this preference of general public to hold currencies with them in order to successfully face for these kind of unexpected situations is identified as the precautionary motive money demand the precautionary motive money demand is also having a positive function of the level of income when the level of income increases the precautionary motive money demand goes up when the level of income decreases the precautionary motive money demand goes down that is what is meant by the precautionary motive money demand and then what do we mean by the speculative motive money demand the preference of general public to hold currencies with them the preference of general public to hold currencies with them in order to make profits through the price fluctuations of assets in order to make profits through the price fluctuations of assets that is when the prices of financial assets are gone down people tend to use the cash balances and buy them and keep with them and after some time when their prices are gone up they are sold at a higher price and made profits right like this the preference of general public to hold currencies with them in order to make profits through the price fluctuations of assets is identified as the speculative motive money demand we identify the speculative motive money demand is the preference of general public to hold currencies as the most appropriate way of holding wealth so i am discussing about the speculative motive money demand in the next question as well in a separate question so therefore we simply identify the speculative motive money demand as a negative function of the rate of interest that is when the rate of interest increases the speculative motive money demand goes down and when the rate of interest decreases the speculative motive money demand goes up right so yes so based on this question we are supposed to define what uh, liquidity preference or in other words what money demand is and then you should identify the reasons as to why people create a demand for money right we will move on to the next question explain why there is a negative relationship between the rate of interest and the speculative motive money demand we gave a brief discussion we briefly discussed regarding the speculative motive money demand in the previous question right now and at that point we discussed that the speculative motive money demand is having a negative relationship with the rate of interest so here we are supposed to explain how can there be a negative relationship between the rate of interest and then the speculative motive money demand we will explain it as i told you the speculative motive money demand is the preference of general public to hold currencies with them in order to make profits through the price fluctuations of assets 
in order to make profits through the price fluctuations of assets. We identify a negative relationship between the rate of interest and then the price of bonds. We identify a negative relationship between the rate of interest and then the price of bonds. The bonds are referring to the financial instruments which are associated with the risk. Shares of a company is one example for bonds. If you bought shares of a company, there is no an assurance that the value of shares are definitely going up. Also, there is no an assurance that you will be definitely getting the dividends. Sometimes the share value may go down in the future. Sometimes you may receive a dividend, sometimes you may not. There is a risk associated with the bonds. So when someone invests in bonds should get returns by facing for such a risk. But interest bearing investments, if you deposited some money in a fixed deposit, there is a fixed rate of interest the bank offers you. So therefore at the end of the period you will receive that respective amount of money. So, if the current rate of the interest is current rate of interest of the economy is high if the current interest rates of the economy is high someone who has money can easily invest this money in uh, an interest bearing investments and get a good stable return for them without facing for a risk at such situations people are not much uh, moving to the investments in bonds because there is a good method of investment for them with a good return so when the rate of interest is high demand for bonds is low and therefore bond prices of the economy will be low therefore bond prices of the economy will be low to the other way when the rate of interest is low the investors are not getting a good return through interest bearing investments because the rate of interest of the economy is low. So they are moving for more uh, risk associated investments like bonds and all, the shares of companies and all. So when the rate of interest of the economy is low, the demand for bonds will be high and therefore bond prices will be high. So therefore there is such a negative relationship between the interest rates of the economy and then the bond prices right so if the current rate of interest of the economy is high the bond prices of the economy should be low why there is a negative relationship between the rate of interest and then the price of bonds so if the interest rates of the economy is high, bond prices of the economy should be low. If the interest rates of the economy is high, the bond prices of the economy should be low. So the speculators will think, who are the speculators? They are the ones who are buying assets at low prices keeping those assets for some period of time with them and when their prices are gone up sold at a higher price and make profits they are the speculators so if the current rate of interest is high in the economy the bond prices of the economy will be low We learned that there is a negative relationship between the rate of interest and the price of bonds. So the speculators will think that in the future the rate of interest should go down by the current interest is high now. The interest rates of the economy should go down in the future and therefore the bond prices should go up. What do the speculators do today? They will use their cash balances and purchase bonds and keeping those bonds with them why they expect that in the future the interest rates will go down 
and therefore bond prices will go up. So if the bond prices are going up, they can sell those bonds at a higher price and make profits. So interest rates of the economy is high, bond prices will be low, the speculators use their cash balances and purchase more bonds and keeping bonds with them. They don't keep cash balances with them. Instead, they are keeping bonds with them. So what happens is, the speculative motive money demand is low when the rate of interest is high. The people are keeping less cash balances with them. Instead of cash balances, they are keeping bonds with them. To the other way, if the rate of interest of the economy is low, the bond prices of the economy will be high. If the rate of interest of the economy is low, the bond prices of the economy will be high. What do the speculators do? The speculators are having bonds with them which are bought at low prices at past. So they will sell those bonds at high prices at the moment and keep cash balances with them in order to buy bonds in the future when their prices are going down. So therefore, the interest rates of the economy is low means the speculative motive money demand will be high. People are tending to keep more cash balances with them on speculative motive and they are converting the bonds they are holding uh, at uh, a profit into cash and keep cash balances with them. So this is how we can explain this negative relationship between the rate of interest and then the speculative motive money demand. So we will go to the answer. There is a negative relationship between the rate of interest and the price of bonds. So in order to explain the negative relationship which is there between the rate of interest and the price of uh, bonds, we need to state that there is a negative relationship between the rate of interest and then the price of bonds first when we are explaining the negative relationship between the rate of interest and then the speculative motive money demand. right therefore if the rate of interest increases price of bonds go down speculators expect that the rate of interest will go down in the future and therefore bond prices will go up speculators use their cash balances and purchases more bonds at low prices at present Due to this, speculative motive money demand is low when the rate of interest is high. So in this section, we explain that the uh, how the speculative motive money demand goes down when the rate of interest is high. So in a separate section, we will explain how the speculative motive money demand is high. That is why people are holding more cash balances with them on speculative motive when the rate of interest is low, we will see. Also when the rate of interest is low, the bond prices of the economy will be high, right? Therefore, the speculators will uh, sell the bonds they hold at high prices making profits and keep cash balances with them. In order to buy bonds in the future when their prices are decreased. Due to this, the speculative motive money demand is high when the rate of interest is low. Right? So here in one section you need to explain how can there be a, a higher speculative motive money demand when the rate of interest is low. And in another section, you should explain why the speculative motive money demand is low when the rate of interest is high. Bye. Next question. Explain the relationship between the money supply and the aggregate demand. So what do we mean by money supply? 
the money supply refers to the stock of money held by the general public of a country as at a given point of time. So when say money supply, not only the currencies are taken into consideration when identifying the money supply, but money supply has two major components in general. Uh, you should be aware that we are categorizing money supply into different categories as M1, M2, M2B and M4 based on different different components. Uh, but from an overall point of view, the money supply has only two components. What are those? One is currency held by public, other one is the deposits held by public in the banking system. One is currency held by public, other one is deposits held by public in the banking system. Various types of deposits. Uh, demand deposits held by public in commercial banks, the time and savings deposits held by public in commercial banks, the non-resident foreign currency deposits, the residence deposits in foreign currency banking units, the time and savings deposits held by public in the licensed specialized banks, the time and savings deposits held by public in the licensed finance companies, all these deposits are taken into consideration when computing the money supply. Right? So, we are uh, supposed to explain the relationship between the money supply and the aggregate demand here. What do we mean by the aggregate demand? Aggregate demand refers to the total planned expenditure on goods and services by all the economic units at different uh, levels, uh, at different price levels. So we know that aggregate demand comprises of four components. Aggregate demand comprises of four components. What are the components of aggregate demand or aggregate expenditure? consumption expenditure, investments expenditure, government purchases and then the net exports are the components of aggregate expenditure. So when the money supply of the economy increases what happens is when the money supply of the economy goes up the rate of interest of the economy will go down. The interest rates will go down. The uh, deposits rates, the rowing rates, everything will go down. When say interest rates, you should not have a confusion with you whether we are talking about the deposit rates here or whether we are talking about the lending rates here. Right? Because when say the rate of interest, it is general rate of interest in the economy. Right? So when uh, the banks are offering a 10% interest on fixed deposits, they can't offer loans at 8%. Right? So if they are accepting deposits at a, an interest rate of 10%, they might be offering loans at some 15%. Right? So the lending rate is always higher than the borrowing rate. So when the uh, lending rate is higher than always the deposit rates. So if the deposit rates are going up, that will be leading for the lending rates also to go up. So therefore, when say rates of interest, it is a general term which is used to identify the interest rates of the whole economy. So if the money supply of the economy increases, what happens is, if the money supply of the economy increases, what happens is, the interest rates of the economy will go down interest rates of the economy will go down. When the interest rates are decreased, there are some components of this aggregate expenditure which are sensitive to the rate of interest, especially the private investments expenditure. Inside the consumption, there are durable consumption activities like buying furniture, buying electronic equipment, right? buying motor vehicles, right? these are treated as durable consumption which under the private consumption or household consumption expenditure 
when say household consumption it includes the non durable goods like rice wheat flour milk and all those things the durable goods like electricity uh, sorry electronic equipment furniture motor vehicles and all and the consumption of services so when the money supply of the economy increases what happens to the rate of interest will go down as a result the components of aggregate demand which are sensitive to the rate of interest the components of aggregate demand which are sensitive to the rate of interest will start to go up these will be going up so these are going up means what the aggregate expenditure of the economy will also go up aggregate expenditure of the economy will also go up right so therefore money supply increases the rate of interest goes down right and therefore the components of aggregate demand which are sensitive to the rate of interest are increased so aggregate demand goes up to the other way if money supply of the economy decreased what happens is if money supply of the economy decreased what happens is the rate of interest of the economy will go up the rate of interest of the economy will go up as a result what happens is the components of aggregate demand which are sensitive to the rate of interest like durable consumption expenditure the private investments expenditure these are the components which are components of aggregate expenditure which are sensitive to the rate of interest right these will be uh, discouraged by money supply decreases interest rates go up so therefore these will go down because of high rates of interest these are going down means what the aggregate expenditure of the economy will also be decreased so this is how we can explain the positive relationship which is there between the money supply and the aggregate demand so see there is a positive relationship between money supply and aggregate demand this can be explained based on the behavior of rate of interest this paragraph is allocated to explain how aggregate demand increases when money supply goes up like this you have to uh, explain the separate sections uh, by like like the positive relationship between the money supply and aggregate demand what happens when money supply increases in one section and what happens to the money aggregate demand when money supply decreases in another section when the money supply of the economy is high the rate of interest will be low the rate of interest will be low some components of aggregate demand which are sensitive to the rate of interest such as durable consumption expenditure and the private investment expenditure will be increased this increases the aggregate demand accordingly the aggregate demand increases when money supply is increased next one when money supply of the economy is low the rate of interest will be high some components of aggregate demand which are sensitive to the rate of interest such as durable consumption expenditure and the private investments expenditure will be discouraged this decreases the aggregate demand accordingly the aggregate demand decreases when money supply decreases so this is how we can explain the positive relationship between the money supply and the aggregate demand first of all we should say that there is a positive relationship between the money supply and aggregate demand in one point and then you should explain why does the aggregate demand go up when money supply increases in another section you should explain why does the aggregate demand go down when money supply decreases
Right. Question number 10. What do you mean by the velocity of circulation of money? What is the importance of the calculating of velocity of circulation of money? First of all, we will explain what is meant by the velocity of circulation of money. Now, with an example, I will explain this first. Say there are four people, A, B, C and D. Say person A has a thousand rupee currency note with him. And say this thousand rupee currency note is offered to person B and purchases a good worth of thousand rupees from person B. Now this thousand rupee currency note is there with person B. Say now the person B is spending this thousand rupee currency note on person C and purchasing something from person C. A good worth of thousand rupees from person C. Now this thousand rupee currency note is there with person C. Say all these transactions are taking place in one day's period. And now, say this thousand rupees uh, currency note is offered to person D and purchases a good worth of thousand rupees from person D. Right. So, A bought a good from person B by spending thousand rupees. B bought a good worth of thousand rupees from person C by spending thousand rupees. And C bought a good worth of thousand rupees from person D by spending this thousand rupees. By spending this thousand rupees. Right? So, therefore, the same thousand rupee currency note is used three times for transactions or to purchase three thousand worth of goods and services on the same day but one single thousand rupee currency note is being transacted three times a day and purchased a goods a purchased goods worth of three thousand within the same day's period so if that is what is happening per day what might be happening for one month's period what might be happening for a five months period one year's period like this the same currency note may be used for number of times for transactions during a given uh, period. The same currency note may be used for some number of times for transactions during a given period of time. So this average number of times a money unit is used for transactions during a given period of time is what we identify as the velocity of circulation of money. But when we are practically calculating this, we can't go behind each currency note and see how many times each currency note is used for transactions. So what do we do? We divide the value of the gross domestic product of the country. What do we mean by the gross domestic product? The gross domestic product refers to the total market value of all the final goods and services produced within an economic territory during a given period of time. So that shows the monetary value, the financial value of goods and services produced in that economy during that given uh, year's period. To the other way, the money supply shows the stock of money held by the general public of that country for that given period of time. So, with an example, say the money supply of the economy is some 5000 million rupees. Right? But say, The value of gross domestic product of the country is some 80,000 million rupees. 
money stock of the economy is 5000 million rupees the value of the gross domestic product of the country is 80000 million rupees what does it mean a money stock worth of 5000 is being used for purchasing a stock of goods and services worth of 8000 during a given year's period what does this mean it has been used an average number of times of 16 times for transactions during this given year's period so therefore we use the general formula gross domestic product divided by the money supply of the country to calculate the velocity of circulation of money therefore the velocity of circulation of money gives the average value the average number of times a money unit is used for transactions during a given uh, period of time so see the first section of the question is what do you mean by the velocity of circulation of money and what is the importance of calculating the velocity of circulation of money so the average number of times a currency unit is used for transactions during a given period of time is identified as the velocity of circulation of money the velocity of circulation of money can be calculated as follows the gross domestic product divided by the money supply and then the rest part of the question the importance of velocity of circulation of money in one hand we can identify the average number of times a money unit is used for transactions during a given period of time by looking at the velocity of circulation of money by looking at the velocity of circulation of money on the other hand uh, there is a negative relationship between the velocity uh, and the money demand what do we mean by the money demand we learned and we discussed that money demand refers to the average sorry the preference of general public to hold currencies with them as at a given point of time so if the general public of an economy has kept those cash balances with them then they will not be able to use them for transactions no? they should have not used them for transactions no? so money demand is high means the velocity will be low to the other way if the people have kept their use their cash balances continuously for transactions frequently for transactions money demand will be low so by looking at the uh, velocity of circulation of money we can get an understanding regarding the money demand of the economy as well also in operating the monetary policy of an economy the uh, velocity of circulation of money will be used so these are the importance of the uses of calculating the velocity of circulation of money right we will move on to the next question following details are given in relation to a hypothetical economy m1 money multiplier currency held by commercial banks deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank and then m1 narrow money supply is given time and savings deposits held by public in commercial banks is given the resident foreign currency deposits in foreign currency banking units is given non-resident foreign currency deposits treated as domestic deposit liabilities is given so the first part of the question is to calculate the currency held by public 
right? Based on this, we are supposed to calculate the currency held by public, PVC. So based on this information, they have given us the M1 money multiplier. How do we calculate the M1 money multiplier? Money multiplier is calculated by we are representing the money multiplier with K by using the formula money supply divided by high powered money. Right. So, as uh, they have given us the M1 narrow money sub multiplier, uh, they have given us money multiplier as 6. Right. Also, they have given us currency held by commercial banks, the deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank, and then M1 narrow money supply is given in this question. The M1 narrow money supply is how much? 12,000. With that, we can calculate the high powered money of the economy. How much? High powered money of the economy is 2000. Like this, we can calculate the high powered money of the economy. And then, The high powered money has three components, three main components. What are those? Currency held by public, currency held by commercial banks, and then deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank. Deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank. We already calculated in the previous question sorry previous uh, section that high powered money of the economy is 2000 we are supposed to find out the currency held by public so they have given us the other two components of high powered money currency held by commercial banks is given deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank is given so currency held by public in uh, sorry, currency held by commercial banks is 800, deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank is 200. So, with this, we can calculate the currency held by public as 1000. So, You can see the calculation. M1 money supply divided by high powered money gives you the high powered money. High powered money is the total of currency held by public, currency held by commercial banks and deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank. And they have already given us the currency held by public and the currency held by, sorry, they have already given us the uh, currency held by commercial banks and the deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank. So, on that basis, the currency held by public is 1000. The next question is to calculate the M2 broad money supply. Right, based on this information, we are supposed to calculate the M2 broad money supply. Now, in this, the M1 narrow money supply is there with us. M1 narrow money supply is there with us. For this, you need to add the time and savings deposits held by public uh, in the commercial banks in order to obtain the M2 broad money supply. So, they have directly given us the time and savings deposits held by public in commercial banks. So, therefore, directly we can add them together and get the M2 broad money supply. 
right? The currency held by public plus demand deposits held by public all together is M1 narrow money supply. The M1 narrow money supply is given in the question as 12,000. The time and savings deposits held by public in commercial banks is also given in the question 2,500. Therefore, M2 broad money supply is 14,500. Part C, M2B consolidated broad money supply should be calculated. We will go back to the question. Now we already calculated the M2 broad money supply. So in order to convert M2B, M2 into M2B, we need to add two more components. One is 50% of non-resident foreign currency deposits. So why do we take 50%? Actually, it might not always be 50%. We identify an adjusted figure here. When it comes to the non-resident foreign currency deposits, the account holder is not in Sri Lanka, even though the account is maintained in the commercial banking system of Sri Lanka. The account holder is staying outside the country. Some of these account holders might be Sri Lankans and they are coming to Sri Lanka and using those cash balances within the Sri Lankan economy. While some others are not even Sri Lankans, sometimes they might be Sri Lankans, but they are not using those cash balances within the Sri Lankan economy. So therefore, there is no point of taking all the NRFCs into account in estimating the broad money supply. Therefore, we only take an adjusted figure of NRFCs, the non-resident foreign currency deposits in estimating the money supply. When that adjusted figure is not given, if the total figure is given, we are taking only 50% of it. But if the adjusted figure is given, then we don't have to take 50% of it, we have to take the full figure. When the total NRFCC is given, we take only 50% of it. We take only 50% of it. But if the adjusted non-resident foreign currency deposits are given, we don't uh, take 50% of that, instead we take the full figure. If you look at here, what does it say? Last detail, non-resident foreign currency deposits treated as domestic deposit liabilities. Non-resident foreign currency deposits treated as domestic deposit liabilities. How much? 3,300. It, it is the adjusted figure, right? It is the adjusted figure. Right? So, when we are given the adjusted figure, we don't have to take 50%, we have to take the full figure. And then the other component needed to add here is the uh, residence deposits in foreign currency banking units. Here the speciality is, the account holder is uh, living in Sri Lanka within the economy, but he is maintaining this uh, deposit in terms of a certain foreign currency unit maybe in terms of dollars, yen or some other foreign currency unit. So we take the full figure here. So we will look at the calculation. The M2 broad money supply, we already calculated as 14,500, right? And then non-resident foreign currency deposits treated as domestic deposit liabilities 4,200. And then the resident foreign currency deposits in foreign currency banking units. So the total of those uh, three figures is 22,000. So therefore, uh, M2B broad money supply of the economy is 22,000. Right. The last part of it is to calculate the M2B money multiplier. In the previous section, we calculated the
uh, M2B uh, money, uh, M2B money supply, and it was 22,000. We already calculated the M2B money supply in Part C, and it was 22,000. Right. So this M2B money supply should be divided by high-powered money. We already calculated the high-powered money at the first section itself. We calculated high-powered money as 2000. So we should divide the M2B broad money supply by the high-powered money in order to calculate the M2B money multiplier. Therefore, M2B money multiplier should be 11 think you understood so we learned how to calculate high powered money m1 money multiplier m1 money supply the m2 broad money supply and then m2b consolidated broad money supply and the m2b broad money multiplier Right, question number 12. Explain the demand pull inflation and cost push inflation using appropriate diagrams. Explain demand pull inflation and cost push inflation using appropriate diagrams. First of all, what do we mean by inflation? Inflation refers to the continuous increase in the general price level of a country the continuous increase in the general price level of a country during a given period of time is what we identify as the inflation. The sustained increase in the general price level of a country. We identify two reasons for this inflation. One is demand pull inflation, other one is cost push inflation. So in this question, we are supposed to explain what is meant by the demand pull inflation and then what is meant by the cost push inflation. First of all, we will see what is meant by the demand pull inflation. Demand pull inflation refers to the increase in the general price level of a country due to the increase in the aggregate demand for goods and services. If the general price level of the country increases due to the increase in the aggregate demand for goods and services, we identify that as the demand pull inflation. Actually, we use two approaches to explain the demand pull inflation. One is the Keynesian approach the other one is the quantity theory of money. So usually when we are explaining the demand pull inflation, we use the Keynesian approach. According to the Keynesian approach, what do we mean by the demand pull inflation? Up to the point of reaching the full employment national income, up to the point of reaching the full employment level of national income. If the aggregate demand of the economy goes up, the producers can respond for that by increasing their level of production. Up to the point of reaching the full employment national income, if aggregate demand increased, the producers also can respond for this by increasing their level of production. But even after achieving the full employment national income, even after achieving the full employment national income, if the aggregate demand of the economy is further going up, even after achieving the full employment level of national income, if the aggregate demand is further increasing, the other producers are not in a position of responding for this 
by increasing their level of production because they already achieved the full employment national income. So when an economy is achieving the full employment national income, if the aggregate demand is further increased, that will lead for the general price level of the economy to go up. So we identify this as the demand pool in region. Look at this please. Increasing the general price level due to the increase in aggregate demand is identified as the demand pull inflation. When the economy is achieving full employment level of output, if the aggregate demand is further increased, the producers will not be able to increase the real output. The result is increase in general price level. This is identified as the demand pull inflation. So we will uh, show the demand pull inflation using a diagram. The aggregate supply curve slopes upwards up to a certain extent up to the point of reaching the full employment national income. This full employment national income is marked here. So up to the point of reaching the full employment national income, up to the point of reaching the full employment national income, the aggregate supply curve slopes upwards. This is aggregate supply. Up to the point of reaching the full employment national income, the aggregate supply curve is sloping upwards. But after achieving the full employment national income, the producers are not in a position of further increasing their level of production. Producers are unable to further increase their level of production after achieving the full employment national income. So at such a situation, if the aggregate demand further increases, what happens is, that leads for the general price level to go up. That leads for the general price level to go up. So the price level increases from P1 to P2 and P2 to P3. Like this, the general price level increases. Uh, if the aggregate demand further increases, even after achieving the full employment national income. So in this kind of a diagram, identifying all the components properly uh, with the with their proper names is a bit important right so this is how we can explain the demand pull uh, inflation using the keynesian approach now we are supposed to explain the cost push inflation we will see what is meant by the cost push inflation Cost push inflation refers to the increase in the general price level of an economy due to the increase in the cost of production. Cost push inflation refers to the increase in the general price level of an economy due to the increase in the cost of production. If the economy's cost of production increases because of any factor, maybe because of increase in the uh, labor cost, maybe because of increase in the raw material price, Right? Maybe because of increase in the fuel prices. Due to any of these factors, if the cost of production increases, what happens is the aggregate supply curve will be shifted to the left. Aggregate supply curve will be shifted to the left. When the aggregate supply curve is shifting to the left, if there is no change in the aggregate demand curve, what happens is the general price level of the economy increases. We identify this as the cost push inflation. So we will see if the cost of production is increased due to a certain reason, the aggregate supply curve will be shifted to the left. This leads for an increase in the general price level if there was no corresponding reduction in the aggregate demand. This is identified as cost push inflation. So we will see how to represent the cost push inflation using a diagram.
real output in the vertical axis price level is in the horizontal axis the aggregate demand stopping downwards So when cost of production increases what happens is when cost of production increases aggregate supply curve will be shifted to the left like this. aggregate supply curve will be shifted to the left like this when the cost of production increases. So the result is when there is no change in aggregate if aggregate demand uh, when there is no change in aggregate demand if the aggregate supply decreases the general price level of the economy will be going up. So this is what we identify as the cost push inflation. So we can explain the cost push inflation using a diagram like this. So when the cost of production increases the aggregate supply curve is shifting to the left. So at such a situation if aggregate demand remains unchanged that leads for the general price level of the economy to go up. Right. We will move on to the next question. Explain how the central bank implements open market operations in order to manage the liquidity of the banking system and the rate of interest. When it comes to the open market operations, the central bank are, is using various quantitative tools as well as qualitative tools in operating their monetary policy. The quantitative tools are used by the central bank in order to increase the money supply or in order to decrease the money supply. In order to increase the money supply or in order to decrease the money supply right the open market operations are also such a quantitative tool used by the central bank in order to operate the money supply under the open market operations what does the central bank do the central bank purchases unmatured government securities from the commercial banks and then central bank is selling unmatured government securities to the commercial banks under the open market operations. Here the question is explain how the central bank implements open market operations in order to manage the liquidity level of the banking system. If the banking system is having a higher level of liquidity, if the liquidity of the banking system is high, there should be a decreasing trend of interest in the economy, in the interbank call money market and in the banking system in general. So in order to control this by reducing the liquidity, what does the central bank should do? The central bank should implement standing deposit facility agreements when the central bank implements standing deposit facility agreements what actually happens is the central bank is selling unmatured government securities to the commercial banks the commercial banks are supposed to purchase them by paying cash so the cash reserves are transferred from commercial banks to the central bank The liquidity level of the banking system goes down 
and therefore the decreasing trend of the interest of the economy will be controlled. So therefore, in order to manage and, uh, and to control a surplus of liquidity in the banking system, what should the central bank do? The central bank should implement the standing deposit facility agreements, PVC. Right? Uh, I will explain to the other way as well because in this first paragraph I am explaining about the lending facilities. So therefore, the central bank should implement the standing deposit facility agreements in order to control, to manage a surplus of liquidity in the banking system. To the other way, if the banking system is facing for a shortage of liquidity, if the liquidity level of the banking system is low, then there should be an increasing trend of interest in the economy. In order to control this, what should the central bank do? The central bank should implement standing lending facility agreements. Under the standing lending facility agreements, what does the central bank do? The central bank is purchasing unmatured government securities from the commercial banks. The central bank pay cash and purchase unmatured government securities from the commercial banks. Cash reserves are transferred from the central bank to the commercial banks. The commercial banks are getting cash. Their liquidity increases and if there is any increasing trend of interest that will be controlled. Like this you have to separately explain them. So see, when there is a shortage of liquidity in the banking system, the interest rates on the interbank call money market will go up. Central bank should implement standing lending facility agreements in order to increase the liquidity in the banking system. When the central bank purchases government securities from the commercial banks, the reserves are transferred from central bank to commercial banks and therefore liquidity level of the banking system will go up. As a result, the increasing trend of interest in the interbank call money market will be controlled. To the other way, when there is a surplus of liquidity in the banking system, the interest rates in the interbank call money market will go down. Right. The central bank should implement standing deposit facility agreements in order to reduce the liquidity of the banking system. When the central bank sells government securities to commercial banks, reserves are transferred from commercial banks to the central bank and therefore the liquidity of the banking system will go down and the Decreasing trend of interest in the interbank call money market will be controlled. So like this, you have to explain it for both directions. If there is a surplus of liquidity, what should the central bank do? And if there is a shortage of liquidity, what should the central bank do? Right. Next question. What is the difference between the quantity theory of money and then the equation of exchange? The equation of exchange is showing the exact relationship which is there between the money supply and the velocity of circulation of money and then the price level and the real output. When you multiply the money supply by the velocity of circulation of money, you will get the total value of monetary expenditure on goods and services. The total value of monetary expenditure on goods and services. To the other way, the price level is multiplied by the real output gives you the nominal GDP, the nominal value of output of the country. So this nominal value of output of the country should be exactly equal to, this nominal value of output of the country should be exactly equal to the 
total monetary expenditure of the economy during that given period of time. Right. So this exact relationship which is there between the total money expenditure and then the nominal GDP or the nominal value of output of the country is shown through the equation of exchange. Therefore, we say that the equation of exchange is true by definition. Therefore, we say that equation of exchange is true by definition. Right? We identify that as showing some true fact. But the quantity theory of money is an economic theory developed to show the relationship between the money supply of the economy and then the price level. We are developing this quantity theory of money using the equation of exchange. We use the equation of exchange and make some assumptions to simplify it and we develop the quantity theory of money. So under the quantity theory of money we say that when the money supply of the economy increases while the velocity of circulation of money and the real output are held constant, the quantity theory of money states that when the velocity of circulation of money and the real output are held constant, if the money supply of the economy increases, there should be a direct proportional increase in the general price level of the economy. If the money supply of the economy increases while the velocity of circulation of money and the real output are held constant, there will be a direct proportional increase in the general price level. So look at this please. Equation of exchange MV equals to P3 is true by definition. Money supply times the velocity of money will always be equal to the nominal GDP. Next one, the quantity theory of money uses the equation of exchange to relate the changes in money supply to the changes in price level. So, we briefly explain the equation of exchange first and we briefly explain the quantity theory of money. Afterwards, we say that the quantity theory of money is developed based on some assumptions. And then we directly define the quantity theory of money. So, we say there that when the money supply of the economy increases while the velocity of circulation of money and the real output are held constant, there will be a direct proportional increase in the general price level. So this is how we can differentiate these two. The question number 50 briefly explain the current monetary policy framework used by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. So the uh, economic policy used to influence on the money supply of the country and then the rate of interest in order to achieve the macroeconomic objectives is identified as the monetary policy. The central bank operates the monetary policy in order to achieve these macroeconomic objectives. The current monetary policy framework used by the central bank to operate the monetary policy, the current monetary policy framework used by the central bank to operate the monetary policy comprises of three targets. The operational target is average weighted coal money rate. What does this mean? It is the average interest rate charged in the interbank coal money market. Interbank coal money market is the market where the commercial banks are offering 
loans to the other commercial banks for a short period of time. Usually the transactions in this market are taking place on daily basis. Today they are offering and the next day they are repaying. Right. So the interbank average interest rate in the interbank call money market is used as the operating target of the monetary policy framework of the central bank. By influencing on the average interest rate in the interbank call money market, by influencing on the average interest rate on the, of the economy, by, by influencing on the average interest rate of the interbank call money market, the central bank is expecting to influence on the broad money supply of the economy. By operating the broad money supply, they are expecting to achieve their final objective of economic and price stability. So these are the three targets of the current monetary policy framework of the central bank. In addition to that, you should talk about the characteristics of this monetary policy as well. The characteristics are the current monetary policy of central bank has the characteristics of both the monetary targeting and flexible inflation targeting. If the central bank is expecting to achieve a specific amount of money supply and operate their monetary policy, we identify that as the monetary targeted monetary policy framework. Monetary targeted monetary policy framework. But if the central bank is expecting to achieve a specific rate of inflation and operate the monetary policy framework, we identify that as the flexible inflation targeting monetary policy framework. So we identify both the monetary targeting as well as the flexible inflation targeting characteristics in the current monetary policy framework of the central bank. The central bank is expecting to maintain the rate of inflation at a mid-single digit. What does it mean? Like 4%, 5%, 6% like these are identified as mid-single digits within the medium term while supporting for the growth objectives. The current monetary policy of central bank has the characteristics of both the monetary targeting and flexible inflation targeting and central bank expects to maintain the inflation at a mid single digit over the medium term while supporting to the growth objectives. Right, from this point onwards we are moving to few MCQs, PVC, which is not a function of money. At the beginning of the discussion we learned that money for performs four functions acting as a medium of exchange, acting as a store of wealth, a unit of accounting and then the standard of deferred payments. So from those four, if you look at here, the divisibility into small units, right? This one is not a function of money. Instead, the third answer, divisibility into small units is not a function of money. Instead, it is just a characteristic of a good money. It is just a characteristic of a good money and it is not a function of uh, money. The functions are acting as a medium of exchange, measure of value, store of value and a standard of deferred payments. Therefore, answer number three is the answer here. Next question, which is not a near money component? Again, what do we mean by near money? The near money refers to the high liquid financial assets which act as a store of wealth but do not act as a medium of exchange. Near money can be easily converted into a medium of exchange. Keep in your mind that the near money does not act as a medium of exchange. So the question is, 
which is not a near money component so out of these five four are near money components one is not we are supposed to identify the uh, uh, one which is not a near money component Time and savings deposits held by public in commercial banks is not a medium of exchange. We need to go to bank, take off money, and make the payment. So it is a, it is a near money component. Sorry, it is not a medium of exchange. Second one, demand deposits held by public in commercial banks. Demand deposits means, in other words, the current accounts. If you are a current account holder. You can you you will be getting a checkbook no along with your account. So you can write and issue checks and directly make the payments from the balances available in your current account. You don't need to go to the bank, withdraw any money, and make the payment. Instead, you can directly make the payments from the balance available in your current account. Why? The demand deposits is is itself is acting as a medium of exchange. We can make payments through issuing checks. Therefore, demand deposits held by public in commercial banks is not a near money component. Instead, it is just a medium of exchange. Others, residence deposits in foreign currency banking units is a near money component. Time and savings deposits held by public in licensed specialized banks is a near money component. Time and savings deposits held by public in licensed finance companies is also a near money component. So the answer number two is the answer for question number uh, seven. Question number eighteen. All of the following steps are correct in relation to money demand, except so we discussed about money demand with uh, some structured questions too. So we will directly go to the answers and see. Money demand increases when the level of income increases is correct. Why the transaction motive money demand and the precautionary motive money demand are positive functions of the level of income. Second one, money demand decreases when the rate of interest increases. That is also true. We learned that the speculative motive money demand is having a negative relationship with the level of, uh, sorry, the rate of interest. Third, price level is a determinant of money demand. The two major determinants of money demand are the level of income or the real income and the rate of interest. In addition, the price level, the institutional factors. Uh, innovations in the financial system are also some determinants of money demand so therefore the third is also correct price level is a determinant of money demand true for precautionary motive money demand refers to the demand for money for day to day transactions is a wrong statement why precautionary motive money demand refers to the preference of general public to hold currencies with them in order to successfully face for unexpected situations and it does not mean or it does not refer to the people the demand made by people for money it does not refer to the demand made by people for money for their day to day transactions right so therefore the fourth answer is the answer for uh, question number four. Precautionary motive money demand refers to the demand made for money on day to day transactions is a wrong statement. Next question, which is not a determinant of high powered money, which is not a determinant of high powered money. So we actually already discussed high powered money refers to the financial assets which provide the basis for the money supply of a country. The financial assets which provide the basis for the money supply of a country is what we identify as the high powered money. We already discussed that the net assets of the central bank decides the high powered money of the economy, PVC. Net assets of the central bank. Right. 
Loans offered to the commercial banks by the central bank is a determinant of high-powered money. Loans offered to the government by the central bank is also a determinant of the high-powered money. But the third, loans offered to the private sector by commercial banks, this one, is not a determinant of high-powered money because it is not a net asset of the central bank. No? The commercial banks are offering a loan to the uh, private sector is not an asset of central bank. Therefore, it is not a determinant of high powered money. The high powered money is decided upon the net assets of the central bank. Right. So, the answer number 3 is the answer for question number 19. Question number 20. Nominal GDP of a country is 1500 billion. Nominal GDP of a country is 1500 billion. Money supply is 3300 billion. And the real GDP is 500 billion. Velocity of circulation of money and the price level respectively are. So, we already discussed about the equation of exchange. The equation of exchange says money supply into the velocity of circulation of money is exactly equal to the price level into the real output or in other words P into T gives you the nominal GDP of the country. The P into uh, T, the whole thing is the nominal GDP and the question says that the nominal GDP is 1500 billion. And then the money supply is 300 billion. If money supply is 300 billion, that into the velocity should give us 1500 as the answer. So, as this is an equation, this side nominal GDP is given as 1500. And then they have given us the real GDP as well. How much? Real GDP is 500. So, therefore, 300 times 5 only gives us 1500. Therefore, velocity of circulation of money is 5. 1500 divided by 500 is 3. So, the price level should be 3. 3 times 500 only gives you 1500 as the answer. So, therefore, uh, the velocity of circulation of money is 5 and the price level is 3. So, the answer 3, sorry, answer number 5 is the answer for question number 10. Next question, following details are given in relation to a hypothetical economy, currency held by public 1500, cash reserves of commercial banks 500, M1 narrow money supply 2500, near money in M2B is 3500. We are supposed to calculate the M2B money multiplier of this economy. M2B money multiplier should be calculated by using the formula. M2B money multiplier should be calculated by using the formula 
एम टू बी मानी सप्लाई डिवाइडेड बाई एम टू बी मानी सप्लाई डिवाइडेड बाई द हाई पावर्ड मानी एम टू बी मानी सप्लाई डिवाइडेड बाई द हाई पावर्ड मानी इज द एम टू बी मानी मल्टीप्लाई Here in this question, they have not given us the M to B money supply, but they have given us information to calculate the high powered money. So we will see how to calculate the M to B money multiplier. Uh, we need to know that in order to calculate the M to B money multiplier, we have to have the M to B money supply. Right. The M to B money supply comprises of these components: currency held by public, demand deposits held by public in commercial banks, time and savings deposits held by public in commercial banks, the 50% of NRFCs or residence deposits in foreign currency banking units. And then residence deposits in foreign currency banking units. These are the components of M two B consolidated broad money supply. There are altogether five components of M two B consolidated broad money supply. From these five components, the first two, the currency held by public. and then the demand deposits held by public are mediums of exchange and then the total of these two gives us the m1 narrow money supply total of these two gives us the m1 narrow money supply right and then The time and savings deposits held by public in commercial banks is a near money component, and then the adjusted value of non-resident foreign currency deposits, or in other words, fifty percent of non-resident foreign currency deposits, is also a near money component because it is not acting as a medium of exchange. The residence deposits in foreign currency banking units. is also not a medium of exchange we have to take off money and make the payment therefore residence deposits in foreign currency banking units is also a near money component so the total of these three figures gives us the near money included in the m2b consolidated broad money supply so they have given us the m2b sorry m1 narrow money supply they have given us the near money in m2b consolidated broad money supply m1 narrow money supply is 2500 and then the near money in m2b consolidated broad money supply is 3500 the total of these two is the m2b consolidated broad money supply therefore M two B consolidated broad money supply is how much? Six thousand. M two B consolidated broad money supply is how much? Six thousand. Now we have to have the high powered money of the economy to calculate the M two B money multiplier. Right? We have the M two B money supply with us. so we have to have the high powered money to calculate the money multiplier high powered money comprises of currency held by public currency held by commercial banks and then deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank the currency held by public is given as 
and then the next detail given here is cash reserves of commercial banks the cash reserves of commercial banks comprises of two components the cash reserve of a commercial bank comprises of two components one is currency held by commercial banks the other one is the deposits held by commercial banks in the central bank so therefore the cash reserves of commercial banks is 500 means what it is the total figure of both the currency held by commercial banks and then the deposits held by uh, commercial banks in the central bank therefore therefore high powered money of the economy is how much 2000 m2b money multiplier is m2b money supply divided by high powered money m2b money multiply money supply is 6000 high powered money is 2000 therefore money multiplier is 3 therefore money multiplier is 3 right so therefore answer number 2 is the answer for question number 21 22. Which of the following factors are not a cause for demand pull inflation? So, we already discussed that aggregate demand comprises of four components. Consumption, investments, government purchases and then net exports. consumption investments government purchases and then net exports right any factor which is leading for any of these to go up may support for the demand pull inflation we will see increase in money supply we already learned that money supply is leading increase in money supply leads for the aggregate demand to go up Money supply increases, aggregate demand increases, means what? Creates a demand pull inflation. Decrease in statutory reserve ratio. When the statutory reserve ratio is decreased, the commercial banks will have to keep less cash balances with them, less cash reserves with them. So their excess reserves will go up, their lending ability increases and therefore money supply goes up. Therefore, money supply goes up. So, money supply increases means that is supporting for aggregate demand to go up. Increase in government purchases. Government purchases is a direct component of aggregate demand. So, if government purchases increases, that leads for the aggregate demand to go up. Open market purchase of government securities by the central bank. If central bank purchases government securities, the commercial banks are getting cash, right? Cash reserves of commercial banks will go up, means what? Money supply increases, means aggregate demand increases, supports for demand pull inflation. But increase in income taxes, if income tax rates are increased, the disposable income of households will go down increase in income taxes will lead for the disposable income of households to go down so disposable income decreases means the consumption expenditure of households will go down if consumption expenditure of households are going down that is leading for the aggregate expenditure to go down therefore the fifth answer is not a reason for the demand pull inflation fifth answer is not a reason for the demand pull inflation 
which of the following factors are not a cause for demand pull inflation increase in income tax rate is not a cause for demand pull inflation therefore answer number 5 is the answer here Next one. Identify the factor which may create cost push inflation. So we learnt about cost push inflation. What do we mean by cost push inflation? Increase in the general price level due to the increase in cost of production. So any factor which is leading for the cost of production to go up will be a reason for cost push inflation. Identify the factor which may create cost push inflation. First one, open market purchase of government securities by central bank. So if central bank purchases government securities, the commercial banks are getting cash, their lending ability increases, money supply increases and that leads for demand for, uh, aggregate demand to go up. And increasing aggregate demand is leading for demand pull inflation and not for cost push inflation. Second answer. Decrease in policy interest rates by the central bank. If policy interest rates are decreased, what happens is the policy interest rates are the rates of interest used by the central bank when they offer loans to the commercial. Uh, sorry, the policy interest rates are the rates of interest used by the central bank when they are operating their monetary policy. Policy interest rates comprise of three components, the bank rate, the standing deposit facility rate and then the standing lending facility rate. So if policy interest rates are decreased, that leads for the interest rates of the economy to go down and money supply to increase and that is also supporting for demand pull inflation and not for cost push inflation. Third. Advancement in the production technology of many industries. Right? If the production technology increases, that is supporting for the cost of production to go down and not for cost of production to increase. But cost push inflation talks about an increase in cost of production and leading for the general price level to go up. So the third also cannot be taken as the answer. Fourth, increase in wages and salaries due to the labor union demands. When the wages and salaries are increased, what happens is, when the wages and salaries are increased, what happens is, the cost of production definitely goes up, the labor cost increases. Increasing labor cost definitely lead for the cost of production to go up. If cost of production increases, that may lead for a cost push inflation. So therefore, increase in the wages and salaries due to the labor union demands is a reason for the cost push inflation. So we should identify that as the answer. We will look at the fifth one as well. Appreciation of the foreign exchange rate. If the foreign exchange rate is appreciated, the amount of rupees that should be paid for a dollar goes down. If you are importing raw materials, paying less rupees for a dollar means the rupee cost of imported raw materials will go down. The rupee cost of imported raw materials will go down. So if the rupee cost of the imported raw materials are going down, that is leading for the cost of production to go down, not for the cost of production to go up. So therefore, the factor which is leading for the cost of production to increase out of these five answers is the fourth increase in wages and salaries due to the labor union demands. So the fourth answer is the answer.
which is not a step taken by the central bank in order to contract the money supply. We will see one by one. First, increase in statutory reserve ratio. If the statutory reserve ratio is increased, the commercial banks will have to keep more cash balances with them, more cash reserves with them. Excess reserves of them will go down. Their lending ability decreases. Their lending ability goes down. That leads to the money supply of the economy to go down. But we are supposed to identify the factor which is not leading for the money supply to go down. Second one, increase in the bank rate. What do we mean by the bank rate? Bank rate refers to the rate of interest charged by the central bank when they offer loans to the commercial bank as the lender to the final resort. So if the bank rate is increased, what happens is the if the bank rate is increased, what happens is the commercial banks are paying high rates of interest for the loans they borrow from central bank. This leads for the uh, interest rates charged by the commercial banks also to go up. When the central bank increase their lending rates, the commercial banks will definitely increase their final lending rates as well. So interest rates of the economy will go up, Loans demand for loans of the economy will go down and therefore that leads for the money supply of the economy to decrease. So that is also therefore a factor which is supporting for the money supply to go down. Third, increase in the standing lending facility rate. If the what do we mean by the lending facility rate? When central bank is purchasing unmatured government securities from the commercial banks, that is when they are implementing standing lending facility agreements, it is something like the central bank is uh, giving a temporary loan to a commercial bank, keeping the unmatured government securities as a guarantee. So therefore, the central bank will be charging a certain rate of interest from the commercial banks. The central bank will be charging a certain rate of interest from the commercial banks. The rate of interest charged by the central bank from commercial banks under the standing lending facility rate is what under the standing lending facility agreements is what we identify as the standing lending facility rate. So if the standing lending facility rate increases, the uh, commercial banks will have to bear a higher cost on the financing facilities. So they will be leading for uh, their interest rates will also be increased, demand for loans will go down, money supply decreases. Fourth, implementing standing deposit facility agreements. So, what do we mean by standing deposit facility agreements? The central bank is selling unmatured government securities to the commercial banks. Central bank is selling unmatured government securities to the commercial banks. Through that what happens is the cash reserves are transferred from commercial banks to the central bank. The lending ability of commercial banks will go down and will lead for the money supply of the economy to decrease. The last one, open market purchase of government securities. What do we mean by open market or purchase of government securities? 
What do we mean by open market purchase of government securities? The central bank is purchasing government securities from the commercial banks, the unmatured government securities from the commercial banks. Through that what happens is, through that what happens is, the cash reserves are transferred from central bank to the commercial banks. Their lending ability increases, money supply goes up, so not that it is leading for the money supply to go down but it is leading for the money supply to go up so therefore this is the uh, step which is uh, like this is leading for the money supply to go up not that the money supply decreases through that twenty five which of the following assets have the highest liquidity? Which of the following assets have the highest liquidity? Liquidity refers to the convenience of converting a certain asset into a medium of exchange. Liquidity refers to the convenience of converting a certain asset into a medium of exchange. So see balances available in current accounts held by the commercial banks held by public in commercial banks we already discussed that a current account is a direct medium of exchange we can write and issue checks from the balance available in your current accounts and make payments a medium of exchange highly liquid balances available in the savings deposit held by public in commercial banks is not a medium of exchange is not a medium of exchange it is just a near money we have to take off money before we make the payment so it is relatively low liquidity by relatively low liquid by it is not a medium of exchange balances available in non-resident foreign currency deposits nrfc's that is also not a medium of exchange we need to take off cash and make the payment a near money component Treasury base is the short term debt instrument issued by the government when they collect loans from the uh, general public. So that is also a near money component, it is not a medium of exchange. A plot of land owned by a person, usually a plot of land is having a very low liquidity, right? Without a loss we have to convert that into a medium of exchange, it takes some time. So a relatively low liquid asset. So the only medium of exchange, the only medium of exchange given out of these five answers is the first answer, the balances available in current accounts held by public in commercial banks. That is the only medium of exchange given here. So that is the highest liquid asset out of this. So the answer number 2 is the answer for question number 25. So during this section we focused on the 7th lesson of the syllabus money, banking and price level. But this session focused only on the money section uh, price level and then the central bank and I did not cover the commercial banking system during this session we will uh, discuss the commercial banking uh, section the credit creation process with a separate discussion so think you got some understanding regarding the applications of this lesson here i was giving some more attention on uh, way of writing structured answers for structured questions covering up all the theoretical areas and like uh, like in a way that you are getting full marks for a question so think you 
understood the uh, section we discussed in this lesson. So we will uh, meet with another uh, discussion uh, focusing on the next section of the lesson, the banking section with the next seminar. So thanking to Bank of Ceylon for giving me this great opportunity to participate for this social responsibility program. We will uh, stop for today's discussion and we will meet with another section in the next day. Thank you very much.